Welcome. I believe we have most of our participants in now. And so I'm Janine Maurer. And I wanted to say thank you to everyone for attending today's session. And um, on behalf of the Historical Society of Woodstock, I would like to welcome everyone to our virtual presentation uh, of Will Nixon. And he's going to, he's here, thankfully, to discuss yep. his latest publication, Pocket Guide to Woodstock. The Historical Society of Woodstock is an all volunteer member supported 501c3 organization. Traditionally, we have a popular holiday open house this weekend, which features a holiday themed exhibit and presentations. This is also the weekend when our gift shop has its great, greatest number of visitors and it results in a very successful fundraising weekend for the Historical Society. And as you all know, and as many other nonprofits in the whole entire world, um, during the pandemic, we have launched into a virtual and online gift shop format. So the pocket guide of Woodstock, or to Woodstock rather, I'm sorry, is available for sale through our virtual gift shop, as are other select books and note cards. Of note, we are especially pleased to let you know that we have our town historian Richard Hefner's latest publication, Woodstock's infamous murder trial, racial injustice in upstate New York, available for sale, as well as our newly republished, uh, it's called From Sunset to Cox Crow by Neva Schultes, also for sale in our virtual gift shop setting. I will put the uh, in the chat our web address and the phone number to contact Debbie, our gift shop manager, for those of you who are interested in doing any virtual shopping this weekend. We will have a Q&A after the presentation. Please send your questions through the chat function and I will ask them directly of Will. So I'll be your media intermediary. All the mics will be muted during the presentation. So at this time, I'd like to turn, um, turn this over to Weston and he'll introduce Will. And thank you again for being here. Thanks, uh, Janine. I'd uh, just like to say a few words about uh, Will's illustrious writing career. He began uh, his career as a environmental writer. He uh, had short stints at Mother Jones and NRDC. Uh, in the early outs, he uh, uh, joined up with uh, Michael Perkins and they wrote a series of uh, columns for the Woodstock Times, uh, journaling about uh, their travels around uh, Woodstock. And this uh, was turned into a publication known as Walking Woodstock. And combined with block prints by Carol Zaloom, he became uh, a bestseller at local bookstores. Uh, Will and Michael followed up the success of this uh, book by bringing out the Pocket Guide to Woodstock in it's the first edition in 2012. Uh, the book is packed with details and tours and fresh illuminating stories about Woodstock. And it's so tiny, you can, a uh, lady can put it in her purse and uh, it's priced at 14.95 and you can read it uh, at one sitting. And I, you know, I'm a lifelong member of Woodstock, and I found out a lot of things about the town that I'd never known about. So uh, it's good for the native as well as uh, a person that's just coming up for a weekend. Uh, recently, Will, in fact, last year, uh, completely revised the book, and uh, it's now in our bookshop, and it features stories about some of Will's favorite. Uh, tours around Woodstock. It begins with uh, the farmers, glass blowers, artists, and musicians. So here we are. Thank you, Will, for coming. Take Thank you for there. having me. Um, I'm just going to plunge in here. Uh, at some point, I may try and screen share some photographs, but I'm not I'll figure that out as I go. <laughs> what I thought I would do is rather than kind of lead you through the pocket guide to Woodstock, which um, kind of covers the whole town, was uh, tell a story that is the story of how I kind of fell into and fell in love with, with the history of Woodstock. 
so it's sort of like not just moving to the area, but but discovering the history of it. And it's a kind of an obscure bit of town history, but I wanted to share it with you because it's been very meaningful to me, and uh, I think you might enjoy it. I moved up to Woodstock. At, I moved up to Phoenicia to a log cabin out in the middle of the woods in Phoenicia in 1996. I had previously lived on East 47th Street in Midtown Manhattan. So I, I was trading the 1030 garbage compactor truck beeping and howling so loud that on the fifth floor, we couldn't even talk to someone on the phone. Trading that for you know, a cabin in the woods with a wood stove, mice, you know, a car an hour, if, if that, uh, quite a dramatic change. Uh, I was just turning 40 years old. I was an environmental journalist. So it was a great transition in my life. Um, the sad part about it was I was leaving a marriage, which I really didn't want to do, but my wife at the time and I were just very different. I was desperate to get out to live in the wilderness. She was a true Manhattanite who'd never driven a car. So we wound up becoming good friends afterwards, but we, we went our separate paths. When I got into the cabin, uh, a good thing for me was I really started putting more energy into writing my poetry and my creative pieces, uh, essays. And, and at, the, at the same time, I was also a journalist. I was writing for the Adirondack Explorer up in the Adirondacks and other publications. Through the poetry, I started kind of scouring or, or scavenging or looking through my past for events and things that had happened to me that were of meaning. So it was almost like writing memoir, but writing it through poems, poetry. And I came to a, an experience I had had. Uh, I had gotten out of college in 1980 met and fell in love with a woman very quickly. Her family took me in as a member of their family and in time we got married. But before that happened, um, early-ish 1980s, I remember a, a 4th of July picnic at a um, country house up in uh, the Quaker Hill, Putnam County, Quaker Hill area. It's, it's the borderlands between New York State and Connecticut. Um, and their family had a, a weekend house in a town called Patterson. Uh, the grandmother had a house up on Quaker Hill. An uncle had a house down the border in a town of Sherman. And so there was a whole kind of family cluster. This is her side, a whole family cluster of, of weekend houses up there. Uh, and so 4th of July, we have a, I had a 4th of July um, party, picnic at a house. And uh, we played softball out on the, on the unmowed lawn. And uh, the event that really stuck in my mind was my, the woman who would later become my mother-in-law, kind of was a very dramatic, forceful, encouraging figure. She sort of took me by the arm and marched me over to meet this uh, old, old man kind of sitting in the king's wicker chair on the corner of the porch with two big hearing aids, owl-like eyebrows, two canes. And uh, this was a man named Malcolm Cowley, who was a, a, a major kind of literary figure of the, of the 20th century. He had been a poet, a, a poet, a young poet in the 20s, had gone to Paris, and then had become the chronicler of the lost generation of writers. He wrote several books profiling Hemingway, Fitzgerald, a poet named Hart Crane, and a number of others. He then went on to become an editor at Viking Press where he was responsible for a series called the Viking Portables, Viking Portable Books. One of those was the Portable Faulkner, which really established Faulkner as a major American author uh, who would then go on to win the Nobel Prize. He did that. In the 1950s, Malcolm Cowley uh, also, he was the one who published Jack Kerouac's On the Road, another coup for publishing. In, uh, in the 60s, he was the one who published Ken Kesey's On the Road. 
uh, Ken Kesey's One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. He also, in the 30s and 40s, he was the literary editor at the New Republic, which has something of a connection to Woodstock and that Walter Weil, whose widow uh, helped found the library, he was, Walter Weil was a journalist who helped create the New Republic. Um, and Malcolm Cowley wrote a number of books kind of chronicling the, 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 the writings and he even wrote a book about his 80th year. So he was a very, you know, he was this major figure of literature and I was this kind of petrified young blocked writer. I had gotten out of college. I had great dreams of becoming a writer and instead I had great writing block. <laughs> My future mother-in-law marched me over and said, I want you to meet this, you know, wonderful young writer. And I was basically petrified by this experience. Uh, but uh, I survived it. At that picnic, later on in that picnic, um, Malcolm Cowley read an excerpt from a book. And it turned out this picnic was something like a 50 year tradition. Uh, and in the very first picnic, this poet Hart Crane had been at the picnic and Malcolm Cowley read a passage uh, from a book about uh, Hart Crane and this picnic they'd all had together. And I, at the time, was not interested in poetry and, um, and Hart Crane, I'd heard of Hart Crane, but I didn't know anything about Hart Crane. I should say my in-laws, uh, future in-laws, their connection to, to all of this was they had had the grandmother's generation. There was a sister married to a writer named Matthew Josephson, who was, he was one of these lost generation writers. He was a poet in Paris. He came back to Greenwich Village the, in, in the Bohemian Village. And he was very much part of Malcolm Cowley, Hart Crane, this whole literary circle. Uh, he later went on to become a, a writer for the New Yorker and wrote a number of uh, economic histories of the United States, one of which is called The Robber Barons, which I haven't read, but it's, it's kind of a current book in our current age of, of great monopoly wealth, and it's, it's you know, sort of a forerunner in American history of our present times. So and Matthew Josephson was sort of their family connection to all of this. Anyway, um, years later, in my cabin, you know, think, remembering this meeting with Malcolm Cowley, um, I, uh, I don't know if I can do this, but if I can get to a screen share. I don't know if you can all see this. This is Malcolm Cowley, about the time I would have met him, early 1980s. Um, Click on the image, Will. Sorry? Click on the image, maybe make it bigger. Can you do that? I just did. Are you seeing it at all? We see the thumbnail. Uh, I've got it full size here. Well, maybe I'll forgo that. Um, in my cabin in Phoenicia, I kind of worked this whole memory into a poem that I wrote. And I, uh, by that point, and people had passed away. Um, let me say a little bit more about Hart Crane too, because I got fascinated by Hart Crane. He was born in 1899 in Cleveland, uh, came to New York as a late teenager, very driven to be a poet. And he, he wrote, he ended up, he, then he, he commits suicide in 1932. He's one of poetry's famous classic tragic suicides. He was on a boat from Mexico, returning from Mexico via Cuba to New York. And he jumped off the ship after the boat had left Cuba. Irony is his grandfather had invented lifesaver candies. So he drowned and he, he, he's kind of, he, he kind of came into us as, as this tragic, the classic tragic poet. 
He did write an epic poem called The Bridge about the Brooklyn Bridge, which is very difficult to understand um, and probably still kind of controversial. There are some who treat it as the, a great American poem and some who don't like it at all. I got captivated by him and captivated by his story. Um, and I found, I found the passage Malcolm Cowley had read and that kind of gave me the springboard to write a poem, which was really an elegy to the family of my former in-laws. And so I, I, what I'll do is I'll start by reading, uh, reading this, uh, just the beginnings of this poem. It's a long poem. It's a book I wrote called My Late Mother is a Rough Grouse. The final poem is an elegy to my mother who reappeared to me as a rough grouse, it seemed, after she had died. This is a poem in the middle of it all called, and it's really, this I, I say is to my in-laws who I was very close to. It's called Batting for the Dead. In 1925, Hart Crane, a young poet having a hard time in Manhattan, spent the summer helping a friend restore a farmhouse in the rural hills of upstate New York. Their 4th of July party was a memorable weekend. And this is Hart Crane. Nothing could beat the hilarity of this place, Crane wrote his mother, with about an omnibus full of people here from New York and a case of gin to say nothing of jugs of marvelous hard cider from a neighboring for farm. We went swimming at midnight, climbed trees, played blind man's bluff, rode in wheelbarrows and gratified every caprice for three days. And then I dedicated the poem to my former wife and I'll just read the first stanza. I'm saying all this because Hart Crane was kind of becoming, you know, not just a figure of history, but he was kind of becoming almost this mythic figure in my own kind of extended family history. 70 years ago, Hart Crane played this game. It's an uphill field with a stone pitcher's mound and a crab apple tree in shallow center, which, which your grandmother once climbed as a child until a pop fly pinballed down and blackened her eye. No one remembers how well Hart Crane hit or threw, but he saddled the young girl on his shoulders and galloped back to the barbecue for watermelon and buttered ears of corn. Now she's dead too. I kind of go on to bring in a number of the figures, the grandmother, the father, these sort of family figures. And it, it's, a, it's inspired by Casey at the bat, trying to make a, a, a mythic poem out of baseball. In all of this research about Hart Crane, what I discovered was that Hart Crane had spent time in Woodstock. And somehow this just really struck my fancy because I thought I, I'm, in a funny way, I feel like I'm following in the footsteps of him and of these people. Um, and Woodstock was an arts colony at that time. Uh, and he just, he, he was a difficult poet, but he was a marvelous letter writer. And so he gave this marvelous account of spending two months here in Woodstock uh, at the end of uh, 1923. So I thought I might give you a taste of, of this. He, uh, he, he was here for two months. He had been working as a, he was young. He was in his 23 or 24 at this point and had never gone to college, but was kind of a brilliant omnivorous reader of great literature, Hemingway. I mean, uh, Melville, Shakespeare. He, he had aspirations to, to be a great poet. And so that's what he read. Um, he had had a job, Malcolm Cowley had gotten him a job copywriting for a company in the city that uh, did, perfume. And so uh, Hart Crane would sit at his desk, they'd bring over a, a bottle of perfume, and his job was really to smell the perfume and write evocative copy about the perfume. He hated this, and eventually he, the perfume bottles on his desk, he put them on a tray and threw the, threw the entire tray out the window, you know, in some office building in the city, gets fired, <laughs> winds up in Woodstock, where he's much happier. So uh, the very beginning, he's on, he's also, he's on Plockman Lane, 
and I'd never figured out where. I believe Blockman Lane is a dirt road at that time. And there he's staying with two friends of his, um, all young. One is a friend named Slater Brown. Uh, Slater Brown was a very good friend of E.E. E. Cummings. And uh, E.E. E. Cummings and Slater Brown had gone to, Par uh, gone to France in the First World War and somehow gotten in trouble with the French government and been put in jail maybe as pacifists or troublemakers, something like that. And E.E. E. Cummings wrote a book called The Enormous Room about Slater Brown and his experience. Um, and the other was a fellow named Edward Nagel, who was related to a, uh, a, a there was a prominent French sculptor in uh, Woodstock at that time, Gaston Lachaise. And I think Nagel may have been the son of Lachey's wife or something. There was some connection there. So these two people, they have a house on Blockman Lane and, and Hart Crane comes up there. And uh, I'll just read you a few letters because it really gives me a feeling. What I loved about this was just give me such a feeling of what Woodstock was like in 1923. Um, Hart Crane wrote, long, November 4th, November, long walks today, wrestling matches and hide and seek on the lawn. My biceps are certainly swelling. The house is just right. I can see some sturdy days ahead, even though no pen shall touch the paper and the typewriter remains clickless. And then uh, he was here for two months. He wrote a, a long letter to his mother, which touched me because he, he, Woodstock was a highlight of his life. Um, and he tells his mother in mid-December, I have just come back from the village whether one of us has to go at least once a day to get the male, male milk and groceries. It is so fine to walk through the quiet woods and meadows, quite, quite alone by oneself and watch the clouds floating over the edge of the mountains like white chariots in the sunshine. There isn't any more beautiful country in this continent than right here. Sometime it would be fine for you to come here for the summer and live in one of the modest houses costing very little. And you can dress as you damned please, read and sleep and take long walks on level or hilly land as you choose. I have never looked so well in my life as I do now. And I'm strong as an ox with the fine exercise I have been having. I think city life is a fake and a delusion. And I'm certainly going to see it, see to it, the more I stay of this country in the future. Only three hours from New York too. Time flies even faster out here than it seems to in the city. I don't quite know why, except that I am always so happily busy. Um, he has a, a marvelous Thanksgiving. And then uh, I guess what I'll, the, there's a final episode that kind of touched me, which is that um, he's here for two months and I'll just read, there's a biography an old book from the Woodstock Library, which I felt lucky to find there, which is a biography of him. And so I'll read just, just this passage from the biography about his kind of closing in Woodstock. As December, as December drew to an end, Crane reluctantly began to plan his return to New York. For a week or so, however, it looked as if he might not have, have to. A hike earlier in the month had taken him to the top of Overlook Mountain, where he had talked with the caretaker of the burnt out hotel that is still one of the local Woodstock sites. The caretaker was fed up with his job and urged Crane to get in touch with the owner of the property and offer his services. The pay was $40 a month, but groceries were provided. And of course, there was no rent for the caretaker's cottage. It would be a hard winter, perhaps a terrific experience, Crane wrote Munson. Yet there was a beautiful view I could see clear across the Hudson Valley and miles up and down the river. And though the only company would be the cow, the two horses and the chickens that went with the cottage, Hart would have a chance to test his fortitude as the countryman he always dreamed of being. I'm strongly tempted, he wrote Malcolm Callie, and would like to try out loneliness and hurricanes and drifts at the pleasant risk of only monthly or bi-monthly visits to the netherworld of common speech. But the job fell through and the very meager support that Crane's mother and grandmother had been providing came trickling to an end. 
Um, so I was, like I say, I was touched this history of this poet had been here and, and lived in this kind of very rustic bohemian version of Woodstock. Um, by the early 2000s, I was living in Woodstock and uh, went for a hike one day up Overlook with a man named Henry Halama, who I don't know if you, anyone would have remembered him. He passed away a few years ago. He had come from Long Island, retired, been an engineer scientist of some kind. And he used to say that he had, I'm going to make this number up, but like 114 patents that he was responsible for. Um, I believe his marriage ended maybe unhappily, abruptly. He came to Woodstock, I think, to start a new life for himself. He was an avid hiker, uh, avid uh, skier, birder, butterflies. So we're on a nature walk up at uh, the ruins on Overlook. And I start telling my story of Hart Crane and his wish to have been a caretaker that never came to be. And Henry announced, Hart Crane, America's greatest poet. He wanted to host a wine and cheese dinner, wine and cheese and Hart Crane. So I recruited my friend uh, who I didn't know very well, Michael Perkins to join us because I knew Michael was a Hart Crane fan. And at one point, Michael had actually written a little play about this Thanksgiving dinner that had been held here. Um, so the three of us got together and um, had wine, cheese, red heart crane aloud. Uh, and it was at that dinner that Michael, or that wine and cheese, Michael had the idea that he and I walk across Woodstock together, uh, which we wound up doing and writing columns for the Woodstock Times, which then became the book Walking Woodstock. Uh, and from there, uh, a year or so later, we produced the first version of the Pocket Guide to Woodstock. And meeting Michael really was my way of delving into Woodstock history. Michael was an avid Woodstock historian, had done several short books of history about the area. So we did the first book and then last year, uh, I revised it and we have a new one. So let me, you know what I'd like to do now is actually open this up for questions and comments. Very good. The technology is always, always something that we have to keep up with, right? <laughs> um, you know, that was fascinating. I, I have to say, um, there's a question and I'll, I'll be quiet. Um, could tell us one of the stories that you feature in the, in the re newly revised um, book that you put out, The Pocket Guide. Um, what's your, what's like, what comes to your mind quickly? What's that? Boom, this is the one that really hits me. I'm not going to remember his name, but there, there's, um, it's my age, the, the, there's a shop, uh, I'm drawing a blank, it's, it's up for sale, it's the old, it's a kind of beyond the colony, over mm -hmm. by the parking lots, you know, it was a wonderful gift shop with lampshades. Yep, Jamie, Jamie Van Wagen, yep. Jamie, Lotus. yes. Lotus. Yeah, that was a, a, a bar back in the 70s. And, and I don't remember his name, but there was a guy who, he may have owned the first head shop in Woodstock. He wanted to set, he wanted to make the Guinness Book of World Records by having the longest continuous DJ set 
of, mm. I think it was 33, 33 and a third days. And, uh, and he made it. And was that Jake, at the village jug? It was the village jug or was it Rose's but, Cantina? Sorry? Was it the village jug or the Rose's Cantina? I think Rose's Cantina. Okay. Yeah. At that time. Uh, Jamie said that every so he retired to Florida, maybe became a car salesman or something, a whole new life. But every so often he would, he would return to the shop and said, this is where I made the Guinness Book of World Records. You know, we, we all share your um, having trouble pulling things from the way back, if you can understand. I, I know exactly what you're talking about, but I can't think of the gentleman's name either. So yeah, um, Magic Markey, my, 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 my phone told me it was Magic Markey. That's so. it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's a team effort here, guys. That's what it is. Um, there's another question for you. So do you did you have a specific methodology that you use to pull into the different uh, to create the different walks that you put in in your new book? The book started, you know, I began to think this was like one of those archaeological digs in reverse. The book started, Michael Perkins wrote a, a small little book for the Friends of the Library that was a walk around the village and then a driving tour. I revised that and expanded it years ago for the first version of the pocket guide and then revised it and expanded it a second time for the new version. So it's more that I kind of, Michael had laid down an original structure and then I built on that. What I found in Woodstock is that a walking tour was a good way to tell the history because you could stop in front of the Woodstock Arts Association Museum, and then you could really tell a whole story, a whole history connected to that building. The Photography Center, there are any number of these, you, you stop at a building and you kind of can go through layers of history. And in the village, those, those buildings, they seem to start as houses originally. So they've really been through different permutations and, 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 and they're still there. That's what's wonderful about them. So it, it was a way to, yeah, I kind of used the walk as a vehicle of just, you know, stopping in a, in a location and going back for a generation or three to say what was there in the past. So it was a very, and I felt that in doing that, I was able to really cover, cover most of the town. So it sounds like you, um, you, you used uh, Michael Perkins's work as a stepping stone or exactly. a collaborative effort. And yeah. tell us, uh, if you can, how far out of town does your walk take people uh, towards Bearsville and how far down towards uh, the Playhouse, for, for example? You know, the actual walking is, yeah, down to the Playhouse, uh, uh, Rock City Road, you know, up to, maybe up to the, the intersection uh, with Glasgow, mm -hmm. and then probably to as far as the library going the other way. Mm -hmm. And it's then not a lot uh, of walking. it's, 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 uh, you know, maybe half a mile each direction kind of yep. thing. Is there one particular building in the center of town that you like to talk about the most? Uh, well, I just mentioned Wham, so that comes to mind. Um, mm -hmm. There's quite a history behind that. Um, I got, I myself, because I'm a poet and I'm fascinated by art, I got very drawn into the whole history of the art, of the arts community. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't know that I have anything special to say about the building, but it was just, it was, there was a funny anecdote, um, names. <laughs> there was a more recent anecdote from the 70s. So much of the art history is back in say the teens and 20s into the 30s and 40s, but there was a fellow who does video art. He was a pioneering video artist and he was at Wham, they still remembered him as kind of a renegade. He was, um, this was in the 70s, they were doing an exhibit and he, his art was displayed on a television. And so when his, when the exhibit time came, he went and carved a hole in the wall to stick his television into the wall without telling anyone on staff. <laughs> so. We have um, one little, uh, you know, across the street from the Lutheran church is, um, Florence Pepper's house, and so that's where Mirabai mm -hmm. is. And did you, did just did, did you have any little anecdotes about that that you can recall, or no, okay. no? Well, the, well, one anecdote about the Lutheran Church that fascinated me that I learned years ago. Well, one thing that fascinates me in general, uh, the Dutch Reformed Church in Kingston, 
as founded in 1649, not the building they're in, but the, the, mm -hmm. the congregation, 1649. Woodstock, their church, founded 1799. Why did it take, I've, Michael Perkins and I did this once. You can easily walk from Woodstock to Kingston in a day, not even longer than a day. Michael and I did that once for one of our Woodstock columns. And we went down 28, we get into Half Moon Books and the older clerk at Half Moon Books, when we tell him what we've just done, he said, you walked Route 28? I wouldn't even drive Route 28. <laughs> so it's, a, it's an ugly walk, but we did it. Why did, if, if they're, so they, they're close together. Why did it take 150 years to get up to Woodstock from Kingston, which I, there, there's a lot of history to that, but I still feel as though there's some mystery in addition to the history that I know. I say all that because the, the Lutheran church um, was founded by, not by, you know, not by immigrants. It was founded by Hudson Valley residents in, in a second or third generation of being here in this country. And they said that their founding documents, they were the first Lutheran church in the country to have their founding documents written in English mm -hmm. rather than in German. So the area was really very settled, but before and by the time people started moving into Woodstock, that fascinated me and it still fascinates me. The city of Los Angeles was created, I think six or seven, founded six or seven years before Woodstock was founded. Hmm. I didn't know that. See, yeah. see how, see how, I love the way history talking takes you in down many different pathways. Um, I was I was just told by my phone that uh, it's Gary Hill is the person exactly yes he's very I watched a few of his I watched a few of those videos they're very wild he uh, there, there's some he did one called Tinker Street you know I, I I felt like I was watching the 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 birth of the universe all these amazing colors very psychedelic in a way exploding colors and this and that and. He emailed me. He got all of that just from filming things up and down uh, Rock City Road. That was it called Rock City Road. Uh, I don't know how he did it. He was he was a, he's a he's still going a magician with with video technology and a pioneer of all of that. Well, uh, he's on a, he's on a, he's driven on a mission now. You know, I have to say when you were giving your introduction, um, I was sort of just musing over your thoughts about how heart cream influenced you. Yeah. Um, and in, in your early years, before you even went to Phoenicia as, yeah. as, a, as your transition through your life. And I thought that to myself, that's a, a, a perfectly noted example of how the town of Woodstock, from my point of view, over, let's say, 200 years has influenced people in yeah. either in the arts, in music, in writing, individuals that have been here have touched people in the simplest, smallest little ways and influence their life as they go forward. And you spoke to that, right? You know, perfectly as far as I'm concerned, the yeah. influence that we've had over the town and the people yeah. that drift through town have had on countless hundreds of thousands of people. So yeah. um, I was glad to hear that part. I didn't know that about your, you know, your introduction to town. So. Yeah. I would, I'm wondering if there's anyone um, that's in the, in, in the group that has any other questions about um, the pocket guide for walking Woodstock. It's, um, it is, it, as uh, Will said, it's not just for tourists or visitors, but it is for those of us that have lived here. And I think Weston mentioned that too, that we, we do learn these little things that we didn't realize and then they spark different questions in our heads as we, as we go through. So if, there's, um, if there is any other questions, we'll entertain them or we will um, work, to, to work to close the program. So I'm just uh, gonna give a minute for something to pop into somebody's head. A minute or two. Do you have another book in the pipeline, Will? Always. Um, seems like. <laughs> I'm working on a novel. Um, I did do a different book, though, called Acrostic Woodstock, mm. which were poems about Woodstock. In, um, in an acrostic poem, I take the title, H. Houston's Son, mm -hmm. and I run the title down the side of the page. So the first letter becomes the first letter of each line. 
So the title is across the top and running down the side of the page. And it's a, it's a, a form, a gimmick. Uh, mm -hmm. And I started them just as writing exercise. And I wound up writing a whole series of, of about, it was a, a portrait of the town in, in these poem, in these poems. I have uh, a friend of mine in Saugerties has kind of pulled me into Saugerties. So I've been in the midst of writing uh, acrostic Saugerties. I don't, won't write mm -hmm. so many, but I've been writing acrostic Saugerties. And there's, um, I did one for the st old store in Saugerties, JJ Newberry Company, mm -hmm. which they, they've done a holiday window of old historic uh, photos of the store. And the poem is in the window. And they're they're doing a, they're getting some local actors to do a, a video recording reading of them, which will be performed at a gallery uh, in a few weeks in Saugerties. So it's not a it's it's sort of it, it's in the vein of Woodstock, but it's Saugerties, which is a, quite a different history. Well, it is a different history, but those Lutherans that are in Woodstock came from Saugerties. So uh -huh. yeah. I must say <laughs> they did. <laughs> um, well, so it looks like we've um, covered all that the uh, our participants are, are ready to cover. I, I certainly am thankful that you came to visit us and tell us about uh, the pocket guide. Um, I just do want to take a minute to thank everybody for attending the session. As I said, you can visit our website and uh, check out what we have for sale in our virtual uh, gift shop. I would also, I will put uh, Debbie's phone number in here in a minute before we go. I wanna thank Weston for arranging for Will to come and talk with us about his book. Uh, I know that I wanted to make sure I thank Richard Hefner and Michael Drillinger in the background. They're the technology people that are making sure everything goes uh, correctly. So I would just say on behalf of the Historical Society, until we meet again, thank you all for coming and um, have a good holiday season. So take care. Thank you all. <laughs>